Our next speaker is the Director of the Missile Defense Agency, an $11 billion agency with one of the most critical missions of literally hitting a bullet with a bullet. Please welcome Director, Lieutenant General Heath Collins. Okay, very good. I think we're bringing up charts. Somewhere. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, representing uh, the Missile Defense Agency. A few months on the job, and uh, and really uh, excited to tell you what uh, what we've accomplished the last year, uh, as well talk a little bit about where we're going to uh, uh, to engage to address uh, a pretty uh, uh, complex and evolving threat uh, environment. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, Missile Defense Agency, our heritage goes all the way back to uh, SDIO, the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, through BIMDO, Ballistic Missile Defense Office, uh, and then in 2002, uh, the Missile Defense Agency was officially uh, stood up, uh, and since then we've uh, spent over two decades of making the impossible possible, hit a bullet with a bullet. Uh, originally focused solely on ballistic missile defense, uh, and then just a few years back as the threat has been changing, we've also added hypersonic uh, missile defense into our uh, job jar. Uh, and we are the life cycle managers of the missile defense system, uh, life cycle managers for the full end-to-end -end kill chain uh, to ensure that we have the appropriate capability, capacity, and readiness uh, to protect uh, deployed forces uh, and our homeland. Uh, as you see that mission there, I think one thing you'll, uh, you could probably expand that out is every speaker that's been talking today, every, every sailor, every soldier, uh, every airman, every Marine deployed, uh, they're all, every one of them, uh, including our families at home, relying on the Missile Defense Agency and the Missile Defense System to protect them from ballistic and hypersonic missile attack. Uh, and so our motto, go fast, think big, is how we do business. Uh, we've always gone fast, we've always thought big uh, to again do what uh, folks have said uh, is impossible to do. Let's go to the next slide, please. So looking at today's uh, missile defense system, uh, a true mis uh, layered missile defense system, we'll go th kind of through the chart, there's a lot on one chart, uh, but it's truly a joint system. Uh, as you look through many of those systems, they're operated by the Space Force, U.S. Navy, U.S. Army, uh, and in some cases, uh, National Guard are, are huge players uh, in operating this system. Uh, so from left to right, you see the different fights. There's the big homeland defense fight, which is by far our number one mission that we focus on, uh, protecting our homeland, uh, the only defense of our homeland from rogue nation intercontinental ballistic missile attack. Uh, and then we get into the layered fight for regional defense and point defense uh, as we ver get very closely integrated in with our Navy partners and our Army partners, uh, providing uh, theater uh, defenses uh, and point defenses around the world. Uh, now let's go from top to bottom. Is that intentional, sir? All right. No, I, I said pull the fire alarm, not the light switch. Um, okay. <clears throat> so the kill chain uh, from top to bottom, it really is a global kill chain. Uh, relying on, on uh, sensors from any sensor anywhere will probably take it uh, and use it to, uh, to, uh, to go forward. Very top, though, we rely heavily on the United States Space Force uh, to uh, provide uh, the initial uh, missile warning, missile tip-off that a launch has occurred. Uh, and from that, uh, uh, those cues will go to a uh, large network of ground-based, sea-based radars, sensors around uh, the globe, deployed, uh, permanent uh, in some locations, uh, to do the next pickup of that, uh, that missile launch uh, to establish track so we can get track accuracy, uh, but also discrimination uh, begins and continues so that we can, in complex uh, uh, scenes with um, countermeasures, uh, we can start discriminating what is a lethal target and what is not uh, as that moves forward into uh, the fire control. Uh, the main backbone of our system is C2BMC, Command and Control, Battle Management, and Communication. Uh, that is the fusing of all the data, of all the sensors, uh, putting that all together and then deciding when and where that has to go out to uh, the shooters, uh, the engagers uh, towards the bottom. Uh, and so it gets the data, gets it to the fire control systems for our particular sense of interceptors. Uh, and then we get to the finished piece at the bottom, uh, whether it's the gr ground-based interceptor uh, on the lower left, which is the protection of our homeland, uh, to regional SM3s uh, and THAAD for uh, endo and exoatmospheric. Uh, and then as we get into SM6 uh, and Patriot for uh, more terminal uh, engagement in the atmosphere. Uh, and then probably the last thing I'll mention on this chart uh, is uh, Thad Patriot, uh, 
over the last few years, we've worked on an ability to integrate THAAD with Patriot together such that the THAAD fire control and the THAAD radar can control both the THAAD interceptors and the Patriot interceptors for increased force protection of our THAAD units uh, and better missile defense out there. Uh, so truly layered and integrated system uh, to increase performance, uh, allow multiple shop doctrines, uh, and uh, thin out the herd and, and reduce leakers. Let's go to the next slide as we start taking a look. So as I mentioned, 2002, we, uh, we stood up as Missile Defense Agency. Uh, the target was pretty simple and pretty, pretty difficult. Uh, it was a ballistic missile, uh, as you see in that top left-hand uh, picture. Uh, it was a predictable launch trajectory after burnout. Uh, it was uh, fairly simple countermeasures, moderate size raids, uh, and all those raids would be single type and single missile type, uh, multiples of the same uh, as we went forward. And so we designed our missile defense system originally to counter that. And that was quite a challenge. Again, that was one of those impossible, uh, hit a bullet with a bullet, uh, and we set those systems up. Uh, one thing of note is on that upper left-hand screen, you see the wedge looking up from right to upper left. Uh, that is the viewpoint of what a ground-based sensor perspective is uh, from the earth as it looks forward. And as you can tell, um, uh, it can, it, it, it's got to wait for the, uh, the missile to rise enough for it to pick it up uh, as we go forward. That's important as we look at the next chart. Please, let's go to the next chart. So today, uh, the threat has been watching what we do, what we've set up, and how we fight, uh, and they've learned from it. And so what we have today is a proliferated set of a much more complex set, uh, very much avoiding the strength of the system we have deployed today. Uh, uh, all aspect maneuvering targets, hypersonic maneuvering targets, uh, maneuvering reentry vehicles, complex countermeasures, and, uh, and what we've seen um, over and over again in, in Israel and Ukraine and others, uh, a combination of all types of missiles uh, and air threats all arriving at the same time uh, from different directions. And so what that means for the missile defense system is we are looking across the kill chain uh, to address that threat and bring the capability that's required to continue to hit that mission that we hit uh, on the first chart. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this should say detect and control at the top. Let's just talk about some of the stuff we've done in the, in the last uh, year or so when it comes to detect and control. Uh, the long-range discrimination radar is nearing completion. We've been working on that for a number of years. Uh, it, is, uh, it is up in Alaska and will do that pickup tracking and discrimination of very complex scenes uh, coming out of North Korea. Uh, Back in uh, September of 23, we did uh, for, uh, conditionally accept it. Uh, we have uh, also tracked our first ballistic missile test, uh, TRACX, with it, uh, where we launched a ballistic missile off the Alaska coast and tracked it very, and LRDL tracked it very well. Uh, it also uh, performs very well in the space domain awareness role, uh, and we've done a 72-hour uh, space domain awareness period, and the U.S. Space Force is getting ready to, uh, is staffing to do early use for SDA uh, for, the, for the Space Force. Moving down below that THAAD, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the, uh, the THAAD Patriot integration uh, efforts that have been going on. Uh, just last year, we did conclude the integration, the initial integration of THAAD and Patriot, uh, uh, THAAD and Patriot, and since then, we've deployed that capability onto uh, the peninsula on Korea. Uh, as well, we have completed uh, uh, fielding that to Guam. So the THAAD battery on Guam uh, now has that capability to integrate uh, with Patriot. Top right, last, this time last year at the conference, uh, sea-based X-band terminal, again, one of those mobile assets that we put out in the ocean to do tracking and discrimination. Uh, this time last year, uh, that's what it looked like. It was in Pearl Harbor uh, doing overhaul after uh, a record setting 661 days at sea. Uh, that retrofit finished, and uh, since April of last year, uh, C-Base X-Band has been out on station again uh, conducting the mission. Uh, bottom middle, C2BMC, I said that is the, ba the backbone, software intensive of how it does that fusion. Uh, we continue uh, to regularly put new capabilities into that to fuse better, to track better, to report better. Uh, in September 23, we did a, a Northcom Indo-PACOM upgrade. Uh, that uh, big part of that was to, uh, to be able to integrate into and task LRDR and bring that into the fold uh, within the missile defense system. And then lastly on the right, uh, Aegis, uh, our, our C-base leg, um, uh, C-base terminal, uh, which is uh, the capability that we put within the Aegis weapon system, uh, wep weapon system uh, to interact with the SM-6 to bring uh, initial hypersonic defense capability. Uh, we have 
uh, been fielding new capability uh, out to the fleet. And uh, early last year, and we'll see it in a, in a later chart, early last year we conducted a, uh, a flight test against a maneuvering target uh, at Endgame, and uh, it was a very successful SM6 launch. So across the board, defect, uh, detect and control, uh, we are getting after it. Next slide. On the engage side, uh, upper left, we have been in the middle of a uh, service life extension program on the ground-based interceptors up in Alaska and in Cal uh, California uh, to increase the capability. Some of those uh, GBIs were the originals that were put in over 20 years ago, and so we're greatly increasing the reliability by taking those out, uh, slapping them, and putting them back into the fleet. Uh, on that homeland uh, defense front, uh, I do want to report back in December, if you're checking the news, uh, we did FGG 12, which is flight test GMD 12 uh, in December, day six uh, for me. Uh, and it was a very successful uh, campaign uh, whereby we launched an air launch target uh, out over the Pacific towards the coast, uh, and we successfully intercepted it. We proved out a capability. The GBI is originally designed as a three-stage booster. Uh, we have a new capability to select two-stage if needed. Uh, and that uh, increased the decision space and the shot space by minutes, uh, by, by a large number of minutes as we did that. Uh, and so, and it was a completely successful test. Uh, on the Navy side, uh, we have uh, conducted a couple tests that are pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal that we just want to point out uh, on this uh, as we put that new capability out into the field. FTM 48, uh, Flight Test Maritime uh, 48, uh, was a pretty complex shot where we took one uh, destroyer uh, launched two rocket targets at it and two uh, drone targets at it, uh, and it conducted a two SM6 engagements, which really involved four SM6 launches, and two SM3 launches to intercept all four successfully, uh, which is, uh, frankly, we did that before uh, October 7th. We did it back, uh, uh, and since then in the Red Sea, as you start seeing what those Aegis crews are going through in the Red Sea, uh, very complicated scenes with ballistic missiles, UAVs, and such in that environment. We were, we were showing some capability back last year uh, before, uh, before that. Uh, and then the second one was FTX-23, uh, which was a flight test. Other 23, we were doing a pretty complex tracking uh, of a baseline nine Aegis ship uh, against a ballistic missile with uh, countermeasures. Uh, and uh, as well, we also had a baseline 10, which is one of the new Aegis ships uh, with the new SPY-6 radar was also on station. Uh, tracking that complex scene uh, and doing some simulated launch as well. Uh, that was also a very successful test. So stepping down here, showing successful GMD, successful sea base. And then on THAAD, uh, I mentioned uh, we had rolled out 4.0, uh, the THAAD Patriot integration to Guam. Uh, that was uh, a major milestone. Uh, one of those, uh, and, then, and then since then we've, uh, we've deployed a THAAD battery. The Army has deployed a THAAD battery to, uh, to the Middle East as things spun up there. Um, we were expecting to do a flight test of a, of, of a THAAD and, and a Patriot launch, but that has been delayed partly because of availability as those assets were deployed uh, to the Middle East. Uh, so back in August though, you, uh, of 22, we did demonstrate that capability uh, to launch, uh, control, to have THAAD fire control, control and launch a Patriot. Let's go to the next slide. Plan forward. Uh, as we start looking to the forward with hypersonic threats, um, the first part of that kill chain is detect. Uh, two weeks ago, on Valentine's Day, uh, we launched the uh, HBTSS, a hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor uh, prototype, two satellite programs, two demo pro uh, satellites that we launched uh, out of the Cape. Uh, those are going through early checkout, uh, but those are designed to prove out the technology uh, to, to demonstrate the accuracy, sensitivity, and latency such that we can close a hypersonic kill chain from space. Uh, and as that uh, is proven out, uh, we will then, uh, we have been teaming and will continue to team with the Space Force to operationalize that into a full constellation in the years to come to provide true global uh, access uh, and uh, to be able to track, discriminate, and uh, hold a hypersonic target through custody through its entire launch uh, for interception. Big step forward to us as we start talking about hypersonic defense in the future. Um, on the right-hand side, LRDR I already kind of touched on, but we are still on track then for, uh, in 2025, full acceptance and oper operationalization and adding of LRDR to the missile defense system operational baseline. We will continue SLEPs in the middle uh, of GBI as we move forward. Those SLEPs, while we are also, we're, we're very focused on the interceptor, we're also doing infrastructure updates as well 
uh, as we prepare for the next-gen interceptor, uh, which uh, is um, a whole step change in capability as we look forward to the, uh, the vastly increasing complexity and capability of, of, of rogue nations as we move forward. Uh, that NGI program continues strong. Uh, since last year, we've conducted system level preliminary design reviews uh, with both of our primes, and we have completed the knowledge point ones associated with both of those primes. We are still on track for uh, a no later than FY28 fielding, uh, which is the requirement in the ASS from Northcom. Uh, bottom left, continued software upgrades to the Aegis weapon system to make it uh, more lethal. Uh, we're getting uh, regular feedback from the fleet uh, on, on conduct uh, in the Red Sea. Uh, we're using that to uh, integrate that back into bring uh, better capability to the fleet. Uh, we continue to buy SM3s to bring up the capacity uh, of the fleet, and we are continuing to integrate and work with the SPY-6, the new baseline 10 ship, to get that uh, into uh, uh, future uh, increments of, of the missile defense system. Live phase interceptor. Um, the capability we have for hypersonic missile defense today is really resides in the SM-6 with the sea-based terminal capability on Aegis for a terminal defense, end game uh, uh, defense. Uh, our next step in that is to look to, inter, inter, uh, to integrate, to intercept farther back, get away from the fleet, get away from the target, and intercept uh, uh, much farther away from that with, during the glide phase of the hypersonic uh, vehicle coming in. Uh, that, uh, we started that program a couple years ago. We're still in uh, a competitive tech development phase, and we continue on that uh, with GPI. Defense of Guam, in the last year, uh, we continue to work with the Army uh, to answer the Indo-PACOM uh, Indo call for uh, 360 degree missile defense coverage against ballistic, hypersonic, cruise missile, and air targets. Uh, no small ask. Uh, on the missile defense agency piece of that relationship, uh, we uh, have our first radar panel. Uh, we are putting a new, uh, going to be fielding a new radar uh, to Guam called the SPY-6 radar. That's a picture of the first panel in the near field calibration chamber. Uh, that chamber, that radar will finish up testing calibration uh, shortly. Uh, we will be, de be deploying an initial uh, vertical launch system uh, capability to, the, to, uh, to Guam uh, with that radar panel, so, and we're going to actually do a flight test uh, by the end of this year. Uh, flight experiment, FEM, flight experiment, maritime, O2, uh, by the end of this year, uh, whereby we will uh, shoot, detect, track, the scrim, shoot, and intercept a, a rocket target uh, off the coast of Guam. Uh, and then we are continuing full bore uh, to, uh, with the Army to bring capabilities phased as quickly as possible to the island as we move forward. That Patriot, we're going to continue. Uh, to uh, improve the, the integration capabilities between uh, THAAD and Patriot. Uh, and on the THAAD side, we're, uh, we're getting ready to start a development cycle for uh, bringing a, a new level of capability into the system to address uh, evolving threats. Okay, next slide. Uh, we're going to have a short video. Uh, I talked about FGG-12, which was that uh, GMD, uh, uh, Homeland Defense Test, uh, as well the FTM-48, which was the 2v2 uh, intercept. So let's uh, play that video. Flight Test Ground-Based Mid-Course Defense 12 was conducted in December 2023 to demonstrate the use of a two-three-stage selectable ground-based interceptor, or GBI, in two-stage mode to intercept an intermediate-range ballistic missile class target with countermeasures. This critical test demonstrated that the two-three-stage selectable GBI could offer greater flexibility and greater battle space for the GMD system to engage threat missiles. Following the air launch of the IRBM target and its detection and tracking by an ANTPY-2 radar, data on the target was forwarded to the GMD fire control node in Colorado, which queued the sea-based X-band radar. SBX forwarded the tracking and discrimination data to the GMD system. Warfighters then initiated launch of the GBI. Following separation from the two three-stage booster assembly, the Exo-Atmospheric Hill Vehicle received target updates from the SBX radar. The EKV acquired the target and maneuvered to destroy it. Flight Test Aegis Weapon System 48 was a complex integrated air and missile defense flight test conducted off the coast of Kauai, Hawaii. The USS Carl M. Levin DDG-120 was positioned off the coast of Hawaii. 
Many miles away at the Pacific Missile Range facility, two targets launched toward the ship, representing a possible cruise missile attack. At almost the same time, two short-range ballistic missile targets are launched toward the destroyer. Utilizing multiple Standard Missile 3 Block 1As and Standard Missile 2 Block 3As, the destroyer was able to detect, track, and engage two ballistic missile targets while at the same time demonstrating an anti-air warfare engagement of two cruise missile drone targets. FTM-48 demonstrated for the first time integrated defense by a single shooter against multiple targets in a realistic, coordinated attack. All right, so uh, with that, that's all I had. Uh I burn all my time? For a couple of questions, I'm going right. to get down there. As I'm going down there, however, you've talked about the defense of Guam, but also, uh, you know, not that you don't have enough on your plate. They also added the uh, regional hypersonic um, defense of the forces in Indo-PACOM. Do you see that as a subset of the Guam or kind of how you're working that? Uh, absolutely. We, we do have, as part of our requirement set for Guam, is... Uh, to bring that hypersonic capability. So our first, while we have that initial terminal capability against hypersonics with the Aegis uh, BMD ships around the world, uh, our main focus for regional today is, is Defense of Guam will bring that first integrated capability uh, from all the services together to include hypersonic defense. Hi, sir. Jen Judson with Defense News. Um, I wanted to ask, I heard uh, through my colleague Jason Sherman's reporting that the Missile Defense Agency will not be briefing its FY25 budget request so long, as it usually has in, the, I think, maybe the last 20 years. Um, so would love to know why uh, you won't be doing that on Monday um, and how you do plan to tell the FY25 budget story to the American public since that's not happening. Sure, Jen. I think the, the first one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block and sidestep uh, I was told that uh, MDA was in briefing, and uh, any other questions on why I would have to go to the department uh, to answer that. Uh, uh, my my uh, my PA lead and I we were just talking earlier about exactly how then we do we get that information out, and so we'll we'll look to do that not in the form obviously that we've done it in the past, but we'll still uh, make sure that uh, when the budget goes over, we'll uh, we'll want to get the appropriate information out. Thanks. Hi, John Jason Sherman from Inside Defense. I wonder if you could give us. Uh, an update on uh, the U.S.-Japan uh, discussions about potential cooperation on um, uh, um, on, on the guide phase interceptor. Um, the radar that you mentioned there, is that the repurposed Hawaii um, radar? Uh, and how many VLS tubes will, 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 um, um, will be associated with that when you, when you move it to Guam? Uh, later this year, and can you tell us about whatever the next big test is that's on um, on your docket? All right, so he just robbed two additional questions from me all by accident. So uh, let's see, uh, Japan GPI, uh, uh, that's maturing quite well. Our, our uh, discussions with Japan, uh, we're actually uh, looking to uh, have a signed agreement in the, in the coming months uh, very shortly uh, with Japan on moving forward as, with the co-development. Uh, It will be, yeah, it'll be a co-development, uh, similar to what was done with SM3 Block 2A, where it's a co-development, portions will be, uh, uh, will be brought to bear and uh, co-developed and manufactured on the Japanese side, uh, along with the rest uh, from the U.S. side. Okay. Uh, let's see, then you asked about the radar. Uh, that, that TAU, that transportable array unit, uh, was reuse, rent-free, non-interference use of uh, the hardware that was originally set up for HDR Hawaii. And then you ask, next big test. Uh, in the coming, uh, coming month or two, we do have another uh, maritime test uh, with an Aegis uh, destroyer. Uh, uh, that one is FTM-32. For this one, we're just going to send one cell because uh, we're just going to we're just going to launch one one missile the entire so. Okay. Got one. One more if you have time. 
Yes, sir. There's always time for zero tolerance. Don't worry, sir. I wanted to ask a little bit more on the long-range discrimination radar. Um, I know there was supposed to be a test in August that didn't happen, and you referenced a tracking test, so I just wanted okay. to make sure that that was different. Um, and in terms of the Space Force accepting LRDR in 2025, what still has to happen before they are able to take uh, full acceptance of that radar? Yeah, thanks, Jen. So, uh, so there was FTX 26 was the one that was planned in August. Uh, we had a uh, a target failure uh, as it came out. And so that's the one that did not happen. Uh, we did have an additional target, FTX 49. I, I believe I have that number right. FTX 49 was the one that we did, uh, that we did uh, successfully track with L LRDR. Um, so uh, the acceptance next year, what we're really getting towards acceptance is we, we did want to track a ballistic missile, which we, we've done. Uh, we are looking to do another track act next year, uh, but uh, part of it is getting enough SDA early use time uh, to, to understand that. Um, and, and really, we're getting to DD-250 later uh, this, this year uh, on the radar, and then uh, more detail we'd have to I'd take that as an action, Jen, to come back to you if you want more detail. Okay. She's sitting right down. One more question. Well, I guess it's a compound question. <laughs> Yep. So the question becomes, if you had one more dollar to spend, where would you spend it? And what keeps you up at night? I, I planted this one, sir. This is your big moment. Did you see? And I did that without his hand up my back or anything else. So. <laughs> well, that's a good one, right? I, I think I put it to the Marine J-8, uh, General Adams, uh, <laughs> if I had it. No, I'm, uh, no another dollar today. Um, Probably capacity, uh, increasing capacity in, in some of our inventories. Uh, as we see the number of uh, of, uh, of interceptors that we're launching uh, in an easy fight, easy uh, don't don't I'm not I'm not in, in a less complicated fight. Uh, uh, we're we're going through quite a number of interceptors. We need to make sure that we have the capacity in the fleet so so they have the shooters that they need as they go forward. And uh, uh, you know I, I I sleep really well at night. Um, you know, I, the MDA team is the right team to have on the job when, when you want to answer these tough problems of, of that complex world. Uh, we've answered the call. They've answered the call uh, for more than two decades, and uh, we, we'll solve just any problem that's out there, uh, and we'll get after it like we always have. So, Thank you so much. Let's right. give them a great round of applause. Thank you. Well done.